the challenge of writing in a second language is is uh, uh, an interesting one, and I know uh, Gabi, for example, who who uh, is our script supervisor on the last couple of shows I did, uh, writes in English, which is not her first language. And it's a paradox. Some people find it a liberation uh, that, it, you know, that uh, the thing that uh, we talk about uh, that the ego tends to, excuse me, to... Uh, want to keep us doing whatever we're doing. So if we're not writing, that's why I say, you know, don't trust anything you think about writing when you're not writing because uh, it's the expression of the ego and the ego wants you to continue. If you're not writing, it wants you to continue not writing. Whatever you think it wants you to do. And once you're writing, it wants you to keep writing. Uh, because the ego, the sense of I am, simply wants you to continue with your idea of whatever your relation to reality is. So the ego, the sense of the self, is always after the fact. It, it is a response to your behavior. It does not generate your behavior, although you think it's the, it's the other way around. So uh, by writing in a second language, sometimes uh, that is the... Uh, w when one begins to write in a language which is not what one usually speaks, um, uh, that sort of gets you over the hump, uh, as the saying goes. Um, and uh, uh, I knew a guy, uh, Jerzy Kozinski, who wrote uh, Being There and uh, The Painted Bird, and uh, he killed himself. But uh, he, English was not his first language, and he, he, would, uh, uh, he was much more comfortable writing uh, in English. And uh, there was a guy who always felt like he was half an imposter, and, and uh, uh, I should think that one of the great uh, sadnesses in his life was that uh, he wasn't very responsible as a teacher. He was a bit of a boundary crosser in that regard. And, uh, uh, and I think that the sense of inauthenticity, of uh, uh, being a counterfeit, uh, afflicts us uh, in, in, uh, is, is uh, one of the things that predisposes to boundary crossing in one way or another. He, he spent a lot of time figuring out how to croak himself, and uh, he finally settled on the old bag and over the head in the, in the bathtub strategy. It, it also, uh, you know, the idea of what's biography, what's autobiography, what is fiction. Uh, the Painted Bird, which was quite a sensation when it was uh, uh, published, uh, was touted and he encouraged its being perceived as autobiographical. The wanderings of a kid through Poland and uh, during the war, during the Second War. Uh, turned out he had... Uh, sat out the war in relative comfort in Moscow. Uh, very talented uh, guy. Remember we were saying that what Pound said, you know, for every writer who fails for lack of talent, a thousand fail for lack of character. Um, Be Beckett, on the other hand, uh, used to write, uh, uh, he used to write his novels in French and then translate them back in English. English was his first language. But he, he, he would compose them initially in French. And uh, he was a bit of a shitbird himself and had a very ambivalent sort of uh, relationship to the idea of form or authority. Uh, 
he was a member of the resistance, and the resistance asked him to join the Nazis, for example. He wasn't very good. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he, his literary father was James Joyce. Uh, and uh, to whom Beckett showed gratitude for Joyce's tutelage by fucking his schizophrenic daughter, uh, for which he was thrown out of the house, as well he should have been. But that, too, suggests a certain uh, impulse to kill off the fathers uh, rather than to learn to live with them. But uh, Beckett's novels, boy, some of Beckett's novels are are uh, extraordinary. Uh, there's a trilogy, uh, Malloy, Malone Dies, and The Unnameable. They're pretty, just for pure writing, pretty good. Uh, so I found my, I, I brought in my Kierkegaard book. You're in for it. Because I want to tell you, this is some tedious fucking stuff. <laughs> Uh, here, this is what we call a uh, catchy open. You ready? A. Despair is a sickness of the spirit, of the self, and accordingly can take three forms. In despair, not to be conscious of having a self. Perens, not despair in the strict sense. In despair, not to will to be oneself. In despair, to will to be oneself. A human being is spirit, but what is spirit? Spirit is the self, but what is the self? The self is a relation that relates itself to itself, or is the relations relating itself to itself in the relation? The self is not the relation but is the relations relating itself to itself. A human being is a synthesis of the infinite and the finite, of the temporal and the eternal, of freedom and necessity, in short, a synthesis. A synthesis is a relation between two. Considered in this way, a human being is still not a self. Now I defy you not to go on after, after that paragraph. In the relation between two, the relation is the third as a negative unity, and the two relate to the relation and in the relation to the relation. Thus, under the qualification of the psychical, the relation between the psychical and the physical is a relation. If, however, the relation relates itself to itself, this relation is the positive third, and this is the self. Such a relation that relates itself to itself, a self, must either have established itself or have been established by another. If the relation that relates itself to itself has been established by another, then the relation is indeed the third. But this relation, the third, is yet again a relation and relates itself to that which established the entire relation. You're gone, right? Nobody can go on. Nobody, nobody can go on. Uh, you know, there's, uh, I've, I've spoken uh on the other hand, maybe it was to a lamppost, so I'll risk repeating myself about uh, that, uh, you know, everyone knows Moby Dick, great novel, great, a great, great, great novel. Uh, my dirty secret is I could never fucking finish it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was properly, uh, you know, I said this is... Uh, it, uh, Coleridge used to say that uh, when he would read his contemporaries and he was bored, he would say, well, I understand their ignorance. But if he read Socrates and he was bored, he would say, I'm ignorant of his understanding. Uh, that it was his problem. And, uh, you know, I was, I was prepared to confess to it's, that it was my problem with Moby Dick you know, but it just bored the piss out of me. And uh, it had to do with, uh, you know, they start out there, they're looking for the whale. 
I'm with him. I personally am not going to go looking for the whale, but that's the given. That's the premise. It's the Pequod. They're looking for the whale. But then they get involved with uh, the construction of the whaling ship. I'm, I'm willing to give them that. <laughs> right? The ship is built. They're out on the water. Once you're out on the water, you know, the construction of the whale. Fuck the construction of the whaling ship. <laughs> then uh, the rigging of the whaling ship. Or the building of the harpoon. The the you 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 get now out the, the the skeleton of the whale, the blubber of the whale, the ambergris of the whale. You know what ambergris is? One of you girls knows what's ambergris. They make perfume. Uh, I don't care. I don't care. Um. But the, uh, uh, now, the, 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 we've spoken in other classes about the tactics of fictive persuasion, and uh, which is just a high fluting way of saying how you tell a story. And remember I was saying that uh, in trying, and this is storytelling of a kind, and, and uh, yesterday, I was trying to explain why I had risked offending some of your tender sensibilities uh, in trying to de make a, define the distinction between fancy and imagination by using an example uh, which entailed a vulgarity and, uh, in particular, an offense to uh, women's uh, what, what might have been experienced as something insulting to women. Uh, when I was saying, well, if I hear this particular song and it makes me think of the first time I got a blowjob from a white girl, uh, that's a fanciful association because there's nothing intrinsic in that song that would make someone else think of the first time he or she got a blowjob from a white girl, or in fact, of the first time I got a blowjob from a white girl. So. Uh, and, and what I was trying uh, to suggest is the doubleness of the artist's intention, which is at the intellectual level to make a distinction between a fanciful association and a genuinely imaginative association, such as the association with seeing a bird fly with the idea of freedom or the idea of limitation or the idea of reptiles. Or, um, but so that was the satisfaction of one intention. But at another level, to bring home the, the felt emotional isolation, which is the living human predicate of indulgence in fancy, I wanted simultaneously to give offense. So that, uh, so that by using a vulgarity, uh, I wanted you to experience simultaneously with a logical illumination a distancing from me. Is it, well, this is some, there's something dangerous. There's something off-putting here. There's something, I'm not sure I condone that. I might want to, even as I listen, purse my lips with a little disapproval in case the speaker is looking at me. Just send him a little sub rosa message. I don't play that rebop. Um, so uh, these strategies of indirection, of, of trying to accomplish a double purpose, of realizing that uh, at the same moment one may uh, be trying to appeal to one faculty in one way and to another element of the spirit in another way. That, and that that is the capacity of this type of discourse as opposed to purely logical discourse. So that subsequently, for example, as now I explain it and I, uh, now you're prepared maybe to take me to your heart a little bit even more than purely at the intellectual level. I say, well, Dave, he's a little fucked up, but he's got a good heart, you know. Um, so what does that have to do with Moby Dick?
Well, for one thing, it's more interesting to me than Moby Dick. <laughs> uh, but uh, now consider the, the chapters in Moby Dick that are absolutely unreadable in the context of, uh, think of them as the equivalent to the vulgarity that I used as something off-putting, as something which makes the reader stand back, even to the extent of saying, I, you know, fuck this, I'm out of here. You know, that was so obscene, what he said, or that was so tasteless, or that was so this or that, because I, 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 I was careful not only to make it offensive uh, on the basis of gender, but also on the basis of race. First blowjob from a white girl. So there's all kinds of reasons that I was giving you to dissociate yourself from imaginative participation in the effort to illuminate. There's some knowledge that isn't worth being earned is a way that you might react. Uh, so uh, Moby Dick, as most of you know, this guy, uh, uh, a person of deep conviction, verging on fanaticism, uh, Ahab. Uh, he's lost his leg to a whale in a previous uh, whaling uh, uh, foray. And uh, he's a pretty charismatic uh, guy uh, to the extent that he is able to persuade others to support his monomania. Uh, they help them, you know, they sign on, and there's all kinds of subsidiary reasons for them to sign on. They make a living, you know, and so on. Uh, on the other hand, it's a little dangerous to be working for a lunatic. Uh, and uh, gradually, one and another of the, you know, okay, I'm making a good buck. And, you know, they, they used to get a percentage. It's what we're on strike for. Everybody on a whaling ship used to get a percentage. Uh, that's good. On the other hand, if we all die, that's bad. If the, if the ship goes under, that's a bad thing. As, as my... One of my Jewish relatives once said to me, 10% of nothing is nothing. Um, and so as the voyage goes on, you know, uh, some of the people on the crew are saying, uh, Captain, and I love you. I have a lot of respect for you. I think you're a great guy. What about another whale? Huh? What about nutsy crazy? Consider the concept of another whale. That isn't such a killer whale. Huh? We all get our percentage, right? Plus, we have the benefit of surviving. That's an upside. Uh, and Ahab gradually reveals himself to be saying, you know what? This ain't about business. Uh, that whale took my leg. And the only way the world makes sense to me is if I go to fuck it up. And so what pissed him off about the whale taking his leg? Well, what pissed him off is it's a whale and it got him, and, and yet here he is pissed off at it. It's like he has to explain his experience to himself, and part of what he's thinking about it is, I'm an idiot. You know, I, he, he, he wasn't a stupid guy. He says, yet I feel compelled to go after him. What are the things I hate about it? It's whiteness. You know, Casper the Friendly Ghost was white. We didn't hate him. He was a friendly ghost. Um, and he, he says, you know, okay, there's something arbitrary. There's something arbitrary. I'll give you that. 
It's arbitrary. It's fanciful, he might say. It's a private association. Even logic, even epistemology, he argues, is private and fanciful. In other words, he says, all of my rational faculties, all of my wisdom as a captain, all of my knowledge about sailing, all of my knowledge about whale hunting, are in the service of a monomania, of, a, of an irrational fixation. Essentially what he says, I don't care what, you know, because Starbucks says, Captain, it's big, it's a big whale, it's a man-eater, but that's what whales do. You know, that's what the man-eating whale, hence the name, man-eating whale. Why? Because he eats men. So if that's his nature, he's not really, you know, it's not like he's got it in for you, right? Some people like sushi. Those are sushi eaters. And whales, some whales are man-eaters. You know, but you don't hate a sushi eater for being a sushi eater. It's just that's what he happens to eat. That's what the whale eats. What are we doing, Captain? What are we? He says, I have to call him evil to make my life make sense within the givens of my nature, which is I'm a little wacky. Now, uh, let's go back to the impossibility of getting through the fucking book. Right? Because that's a very interesting construct. The only thing is, if you can't finish the book, who cares? Um, you get to a certain point in, in, uh, uh, in Moby Dick where all of the rational approaches to the subject matter have exhausted themselves. Every logical presentation which allows you to encounter the data uh, of not only the whale, but of the ship, of what the job of everybody on the ship is, what it's made of and everything. And, and, and you're finally thinking, I don't care. I don't care. I want to finish the fucking book and I want to read something else. I just hate the idea of not finishing. And just when you've gotten to that point, when no other element reinforces your continued engagement with the world of the work, the narrative says the whale, try as you will, you cannot compass him. You can't control it with reason. And then the heading of the next chapter is the chase, first day. By exhausting certain of the other ways of relating to the experience of life other than imagination. Uh, the text has brought you to stand in a felt relation with monomania. It doesn't make any sense. It is, the, it is an engagement with the world on the basis of adherence to the dictates of one's own nature just the way the whale's a man-eater, I'm a novel-eater. And that's the only way to understand experience. Or as uh, one of the Karamazov says, we go in heels up. But only by previously eroding all the other ways of taking of understanding experience, uh, can we get to that one so that I risk uh, giving offense in the course of making an epistemological distinction so that you don't feel that having heard fancy explained logically, you really understand what is fanciful. You only understand as a human being what fancy is when you re-encounter um, the, 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 
another definition of fancy, of the embrace of fancy as an organizing principle, is despair. Private association, which assumes a separateness from the world of experience. So, uh, Kierkegaard was no fucking dope. And uh, uh, in his journals, this guy was so fucking nuts. You know, you know what he published this under the name of Anticlimacus. Because Soren Kierkegaard is too normal a name. Uh, in a journal entry with the heading Report on the Sickness Under Death, which is this essay, he wrote, There is one difficulty with this book. It is too dialectical and stringent for the proper use of the rhetorical, the soul-stirring, the gripping, the title itself seems to indicate that it should be discourses. The title is lyrical, taking into account emotion. Perhaps it cannot be used at all, the thing that he just written. Excuse me. But in any case, it is enriched with an excellent plan, which always can be used, but less explicitly in discourses. The point is that before I really can begin using the rhetorical, the lyrical, say, I always must have the dialectical thoroughly fluent, must have gone through it many times. That was not the case here with the thing that he had just written. Now, uh, just in case you think he can't write, uh, that he can only write in this abstract uh, dialectical way if it is to be structured rhetorically as opposed to dialectically. And what I read to you before, that's dialectical. Just, it, it's almost like algebra. I, I, in other words, every time you hear the self relating to itself, if you gave that a letter value, A, and made it purely schematic, A plus B equals, what he was writing would make sense there of a kind. But that's, that's a purely algebraic formulation, a pure abstraction, a symbolizing of thought. But he, now he's saying, here's another way of communicating. If it's to be structured rhetorically, it must be structured rhetorically under certain main points, each of which would become one discourse. Number one, it's hiddenness. Number two, it's universality. Number three, it's continuance. Number four, where is it situated? In the self, now he's starting to go a little wacky again. But the point is that the task is much too great for a rhetorical arrangement, since in that case, every single individual figure would also have to be depicted poetically. The dialectical algebra works better. Now, it doesn't work better, does it? But it works better for him. Uh, first to represent it symbolically, algebraically, a dialectical algebra. Um, now, he, he's trying to think of uh, another way. If, if he were to express it um, poetically, uh, check this out. Or was there not a time also in your consciousness, my listener, when cheerfully and without a care you were glad with the glad, when you wept with those who wept, when the thought of God blended irrelevantly with your other conceptions, blended with your happiness but did not sanctify it, blended with your grief but did not comfort it, was not separate from it? And later was there not a time when this in some sense guiltless life, which never called itself into account, which was never thought about but just lived, when this guiltless life vanished 
Did there not come a time when your mind was unfruitful and sterile, your will incapable of all good, your emotions cold and weak, when hope was dead in your breast and recollection painfully clutched at a few solitary memories of happiness, and soon these also became loathsome, when everything was of no consequence to you and the secular bases of comfort found their way to your soul, only to wound even more your troubled mind, which impatiently and bitterly turned away from them? Was there not a time when you found no one to whom you could turn, when the darkness of quiet despair brooded over your soul, and you did not have the courage to let it go, but would rather hang on to it, and you even brooded once more over your brooding, when heaven was shut from you and the prayer died on your lips, or it became a shriek of anxiety that demanded an accounting from heaven? But this was soon crushed by the thought that you were a nothing and your soul lost in infinite space. Was there not a time when you felt that the world did not understand your grief, could never heal it, could not give you any peace, that this had to be in heaven if if heaven was anywhere to be found? And alas, it seemed to you that the distance between heaven and earth was infinite. And just as you yourself lost yourself in contemplating the immeasurable world, just so God had forgotten you and did not care about you. And in spite of all this, was there not a defiance in you that forbade you to humble yourself under God's mighty hand? Was this not so? And what would you call this condition if you did not call it death? And how would you describe it except as darkness? So uh, it wasn't like he couldn't do it. It wasn't like he couldn't bring it alive. Uh, And there is the enormous consolation, even as we experience the searing pain of that description of despair, the fact that it is being conveyed is paradoxically uh, a release Um, the yielding to a dialectical algebra at the beginning of now now that was that was a journal entry what I just read to you and the resort to a dialectical algebra before finally coming to an emotional presentation of the nature of despair and its solution which is to rest transparently in the energy which gave it rise Um, is an exhibition of patience, Uh, uh, a making available at the level of reason, since this is an epistemological essay, at at the level of reason, of what will ultimately contradict reason. Now, for a storyteller, that uh, resort to an alienating opening, uh, 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 and and trust me, there has never been a more alienating opening than the beginning of that essay, um, is a willingness to give offense, which in fact, at the rhetorical level, creates that sense of alienation, which is one version of despair. And the only thing that allows you to persevere is faith. In that sense, you, uh, a, a formula that you'll hear me express and at some point that I hope will come clear to you is that the content of any work tests and validates the implicit assumptions of its form which announce themselves in the very first moment of the work. Now, what more fully demonstrates uh, the universality of God's presence than the belief that in that series of absolutely incomprehensible non sequiturs, God's spirit resides and will come to be identified. But you, you have to risk uh, a beginning uh, 
it, 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 you heard me say yesterday, if God is anywhere, he's everywhere. And if you really believe that, uh, as Kierkegaard was saying, I need, at the beginning, I need it to be dialectical, which is to say, I, I can't go through the pain of experiencing that sense of absolute isolation from God from the jump. I have to exhaust the other ways of approaching the subject, including the protection of dialectical algebra. I have to erode my fanciful approaches to the truly imaginative state, which is God's generating spirit. So, not that probably Kierkegaard ever heard that little abstract formulation being described as fanciful, but that's, that's what it is. It, it separates the ground of its meaning from its appearance. And um, if you understand that, if, if you allow yourself to feel that paradoxical truth, it will give you faith as you write, as you uh, live into your stories um, to, uh, to be patient with indirection. Uh, to believe that um, the, the God who allows you to rest transparently in his energy does not demand that you win at the end of the first fucking scene. That you prove him that you have a bango finish or that everything is understood. Uh, if, you, if you act in faith uh, and stay on his path, you're going to get there. You're going to get there. And the getting there may entail a going back. I Please don't confuse me with someone who believes that the first bleat out of my mouth, you know, cannot be revised. That, that, that isn't what I believe. I believe that given my experiences, uh, it's important for me to uh, suppress as much as possible uh, the act of preparation which I associate fancifully with evil, with the, all kinds of things that have nothing to do with preparation. But it's a fanciful connection of mine. And I know that part of my method has to be to minimize that, uh, the dominion of that fanciful connection, or I ain't ever going to start to work. So that's why I have all of these, you know, sort of mystic, formulations, you know, you can't write for less than 20 minutes, you can't write for more than 50 minutes, you have to put in an envelope, you have to seal it, you have to blink four times with your left eye, you know, miracle, mystery, and authority. Um, okay, so, so uh, uh, now you've listened to Kierkegaard and you can, you can say that, if nothing else, and uh, uh, Melville was the same way. You know, Melville started as the author of very popular uh, travel narratives, of which Moby Dick cannot be numbered one. Uh, but, the, 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 uh, you know, he was a very successful writer at the beginning. He wrote uh, two, uh, he wrote uh, Tai Pi and Omu were the first... Uh, things that he wrote, and they were sort of about whaling voyages and, uh, and uh, the bare-breasted native women there, and uh, the bare-breasted native boys, I think. Might have been a little bit where Herman's heart's bomb flowed. Uh, but um, at one level, if you look at anybody's work as all one thing, one work. Uh, something was at work 
in those stories. And, uh, you know, I think we spoke one time about in Heart of Darkness where the narrator says, you know, you go, you set out on your voyage, you think you're going to convert the natives. And uh, two years later, you, you're sitting there with human skulls up on spikes because the jungle does find out what you're doing there. And, uh, you know, the process of art is uh, in some sense a voyage upriver. And, and uh, Melville was cursed with fidelity to the voyage. And he kept coming back to the same goddamn story. Excuse me. And is that audible? Because if it's not audible, I'm not going to excuse myself. Can you hear me, Belch? A little bit. Now, are you being nice? Uh, okay, well, I apologize. Uh, so he kept telling that story, you know, of the voyage, and the voyage started getting a little funky. Uh, and he couldn't stop. And he, it, it, after he finished uh, Moby Dick, his next uh, inviting little tome was called Pierre or the ambiguities. And it made people yearn for the simple, inviting voyage of the Pequod. Uh, and he could not stop. Uh, he wrote uh, a novel called Israel Potter. He wrote... Uh, the last, the last novel he wrote was called The Confidence Man. Uh, and by that time, he couldn't finish a sentence that didn't destroy itself by the end of the sentence. She was a beautiful woman, though some might have said that the scar which began at the top of her skull and extended to the middle of her shin was a disfigurement. Uh, which, which, which is to say that uh, he had embraced the flux of perception as absolutely uncontrollable, that, that there was no stable truth. About. And this novel sold upwards of five copies. In fact, it sold six copies. And uh, his publisher, you know, they had a couple of sit-downs at the Russian Tea Room. You know, he said, Herman, what about every other novel? We get back to the old typey and old mood, the bare-breasted maidens, and, and if necessary, the bare-breasted uh, native boys. But Herman, not the confident with the scar to the knee. Not that, Herman. Not every novel. Not every novel, because no one's getting rich on six copies. And uh, Melville said, write the other way, I cannot. Stop writing novels. Young man taught himself poetry, taught himself to become a poet. And uh, ultimately, he wrote the longest poem in the English language, uh, which I know most of you have committed to memory, uh, called Clarel, the story of a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. 